Hello and welcome to this review of my SteelSeries Apex Pro keyboard. I showed an unboxing video of this about a month ago and now it's time to look at the thing in detail. This was a commercial donation from SteelSeries, I requested it a while ago as it uses their new Omnipoint Hall Effect switches, which of course instantly grabbed my attention and it's got a bunch of other cool features too. But don't worry though, as always it's going to get a fair review and everything I'll be saying is genuinely what I think of it. Now the last few modern keyboards haven't really been all that special, but this one really blew me away as soon as I tried it out, so spoiler alert, it's pretty good. There are some weaknesses of course, which I'll get to in more detail later, but overall it's a really cool guy. So let's dig in. We'll kick off with the switches straight away, the Steel Series Hall Effect Omnipoint switches. I've covered the Hall Effect before on the channel, and if you want to explain in more detail, please watch my ITT Courier video linked in the description below. But in short, it's an effect that happens when you introduce a magnetic field to a flow of electrons. See, magnets can actually bend electrons off their path, which you can measure as a transverse voltage, usually through a semiconductor cell called Hall Sensor. The degree to which the electrons are pulled away depends on the strength of the magnetic field, which, with a magnet of fixed strength, is dependent on the distance. As such, each switch can detect how far the key has been pressed using a static hole sensor and a moving magnet embedded in the slider. In other words, these switches are fundamentally analog. And that is precisely what SteelSeries used them for, because this is an analog keyboard. I've previously covered the Wooting 1, which used optoelectric switches to achieve something similar, and I'm glad that this feature is starting to find more purchase. Now, Wooting used it mainly for producing actual in-game effects. So, in other words, the keyboard functioned a bit like a controller, where games would, for example, steer, more or less, depending on how far you push the key down. Unfortunately, I found this in-game aspect to be somewhat undependable, it doesn't work with that many games, and even then, most of the time the functionality, let alone practical application, was limited. It worked very well with some games, but it's not as widely applicable as I'd hoped it to be, mainly because many games simply lacked the implementation for it. So it was a bonus, and a unique one at that, but not a huge one. And I've been told by one of the developers that precisely because it's very hit and miss, they left it off of this Steel Series board. However, analog capability brings with it another feature which does have a very useful application. It allows you to set the actuation point of your switches. With analog switches, the readback that the keyboard gives is simply a range of values. So all you have to do is tell the keyboard at which value you want the switch to register as actuated. The Wooting had this feature too, but it has it as a general value, while the Steel Series allows you to configure it per key, hence the name Omnipoint switch. Now you might be wondering what I find so useful about this feature. Well, the official reason, according to the marketing page, is that you can toggle between higher up actuation points for when you're gaming, allowing you to get the fastest response times, or deeper down when you're typing so that you make fewer mistakes. And with per key customizability, you might not even have to choose between the two. For example, you can configure WASD all the way at the top and the rest lower down. Or, as they quip in an example, put G further down so you don't accidentally toss grenades anymore. And that's all good and everything, and I think they're definitely right on that count, but it's not just what appeals to me about them. You see, these switches are linear, and personally I like my linears to be very light, because linears don't get feedback, so I bottom out on them most of the time, because that's what becomes the feedback if you don't have a click or a tactile bump to let you know where you're at. But if your switches are very stiff, this gets really tiring, because there's nothing telling you to decelerate before you smash the key all the way down, so to speak, and this takes its toll on your finger muscles if you have to do it with a stiff spring, so I like my linears to be nice and light. However, with super light linears comes a problem. If they're too light, you may be able to accidentally set them off with just the weight of your fingers resting on them, which is crap. This happens to me with Cherry MX Red, for example. And normally, the only way you can prevent this is to get stiffer springs. But with variable actuation, you can just move the actuation point downwards until this doesn't happen anymore, allowing you to keep the light weighting without the problem of unintended triggering of the switches. I actually started by testing this keyboard with the actuation point all the way at the bottom and gradually moved it up until I was no longer missing any key presses and at the height I put them at I'm not getting any unintentional key presses either. So I'm getting the best of all worlds, an extra light switch, lighter even than MX Red, but without the problem of unintentional key presses and at the same time the responsiveness of a partway actuating switch and that is why analog is such a big deal for me. 
Another feature coupled to analog sensing is the possibility of dual event key presses. Again, this is something that the Wooting had as well. In fact, this is footage from them. It allows you to bind a second event to pushing a key beyond a certain threshold. For example, pressing the E key lightly could just be E, while pushing it beyond the predefined point would register as a different output, such as Shift plus E, or whatever other key press you'd want to bind to it. At the moment, the Steel Series doesn't support this, but I've been told it's something they're looking into. As this is a firmware software thing, they can retroactively upgrade all existing models with this feature via an update, which is pretty cool. So that's one advantage of using the whole effect in a keyboard, analog sensing. But there's another, it's contactless. And what this means is that the switches can be smoother and therefore nicer to use. See, in a contact-based switch, like Cherry MX, the contacts are separated by these prongs in the slider, which push against a set of metal leaves. But this rubbing motion creates friction, which can be perceived as a scratchy feeling and sound. Some enthusiasts lubricate their switches to try and get rid of this scratchy feeling, but this can only partially mitigate the matter. Lubricant itself creates a larger surface contact area, after all. Contactless switches don't require this rubbing motion. In the case of Hall Effect switches, it's just a magnet embedded in the slider moving past a sensor, or in this case over a sensor, without touching it. So there's nothing to create friction, resulting in a much smoother key feel, smoother than even lubricated contact base switches could achieve. If it's done well, at least. And indeed, they have succeeded because these switches are just ridiculously smooth. As soon as I tried them out, I knew this was going to be a good testing period because it really is a winner in this regard. It's an excellent example of what contactless switches can be capable of. And the POM slider surely doesn't hurt it either. Here's the force curve of the Hall Effect switches compared to their own red switches, which are contact-based, like MX switches, and you can see that it's actually fully linear, both on the up and down stroke, and it shows in the key feel as well. I mean, <laughs> holy shit, if you want to know how nice a linear switch can feel, you really owe it to yourself to try this out. Later in the video, I'll be doing a comparison with other keyboards, kind of a battle of the titans, actually. You'll definitely want to stick around for that one. Now, it's not the only contactless keyboard out there. Unlike what's fairly heavily implied on the product page, SteelSeries made neither the first Hall effect nor the first analog adjustable keyboard. As far as I know, the original Hall effect keyboard switch is Micro Switch SW, also known as Honeywell Dual Magnet Hall effect, which was introduced as far back as the late 60s. Hall Effect keyboards were revived several years ago by Chinese company Acepad Tech, who boldly pioneered clicky and tactile versions, as well as the more traditional linear option. Meanwhile, Rafi has been producing Hall Effect keyboard switches since the mid-70s, and two more companies are developing new Hall Effect keyboards as I speak. It's also not the first analog keyboard, Wooting are probably the first one who really did something big with it, and Topra have done something with it around the same time. But even certain very rare vintage boards, such as this NCR, which used inductive switches, were capable of setting the actuation point, although SteelSeries are probably the first ones who used Hall Effect for per-key customizable actuation depth. Something they advertise with that's a bit more tenuous is the speed increase, claiming five times faster actuation and eight times faster response time. So what does this actually mean? Well, the highest possible actuation point you can set is 0.4 millimeters, which is one fifth that of Cherry MX at two millimeters, hence supposedly five times as fast. And because the keyboard doesn't need to set a delay after each key press waiting for the contacts to stop bouncing, yes, that's actually a thing, and normally it's five milliseconds, it can send codes with every scan, which takes about 0.7 milliseconds, about one seventh that of a typical debouncing delay, so seven times more responsive. I'm not sure where they got that eight times from. But anyway, this is a gross oversimplification of how a keyboard actually works, not taking into account human reflexes, processing times, key acceleration, star position, relative key press timing, and the time it takes for the signal to reach the computer. I mean, with enough number manipulations and given the right conditions, the situation could be reversed as well, with contact-based switches coming out faster. And although there will doubtless be an overall speed advantage, in real terms it won't boil down to numbers like this when you look at the complete picture. And even then, we're talking milliseconds. 
In any case, it is foolish to make a claim like this based on two simple divisions without any scientific study to back it up, not to mention you'd need to stick the actuation point all the way at the top on all keys before even this oversimplified model would work. Basically, it's neither true nor relevant beyond the statement that 2 divided by 0 0.4 is 5. Some other keyboards, like the Wooting, also benefit from this faster switch response. Basically, there's no point in trying to truly quantify these numbers, so let's just divide them into two categories. Keyboards which have debouncing delays, which are therefore on average slower, and keyboards which don't, which are therefore on average faster. So yeah, in short, forget the 5 times and 8 times stuff, it's simply faster than a contact-based switch can offer, period. Perhaps the worst marketing claim, which doesn't even pertain to their own board, was that this was the biggest leap forward since the invention of the mechanical switch over 35 years ago. That means whomever wrote this clearly thought that Cherry invented the mechanical keyboard. Cherry MX is a bit over 35 years old. But as I already mentioned, even Hall Effect keyboard switches were already being made five decades ago, and Cherry MX brought absolutely nothing new to the table. So to a vintage keyboard collector like me, especially one who detests the boundless mediocrity that is Cherry MX, this implicit claim that Cherry somehow invented the mechanical keyboard is more or less the ultimate insult. On another point, the marketing speak probably actually underestimates their product, claiming a lifetime of 100 million cycles, which is double that of Cherry MX. However, this figure should be much higher, as Hall Effect switches are virtually indestructible, hence why they're used in the military, aviation, aeronautics and other industries where the absolute greatest reliability is paramount. So it's likely much higher than 100 million, they just, and this was confirmed in private correspondence with the devs, stopped measuring after about a year. Several other companies cut off measurements at 100 million as well, but Honeywell's claim of 30 billion cycles per key gives us an indication of what Hall Effect switches can be truly capable of. Really, in terms of pure reliability, Hall Effect switches should be the uncontested winners, trumping even magnetic reeds, which also should last into the billions. Anyway, so the switches are ridiculously smooth, very fast, have adjustable actuation, and are more or less indestructible. But what about the keyboard itself? Well, the build quality is pretty decent. It's very light at only about 840 grams sans cable, but it comes with a sturdy and really rather thick 1.5mm metal mounting plate, which they claim is made out of Series 5000 aircraft grade aluminum, which is a magnesium alloy with very high corrosion resistance. The bottom case is fairly thin plastic, and the switches are fairly exposed on the top of the keyboard, but they're so reliable that it probably doesn't matter anyway. The mounting plate is fixed at the bottom case with 16 screws which are located here. Thankfully there's none hidden behind any of the rubber feet or something. It's even got a three-way cable gutter at the back and some very nice high quality rubber shot flip out feet. It's getting rarer to find simple but welcome features like this, I like it. A very thick cable as well which is partially because it's got a pass-through in it for a USB port which is located here. It's also a decently good-looking keyboard, in my opinion. They didn't try to make it look like a stealth fighter or something, it's just a rectangular black look. There are some bells and whistles, of course, like this tucked-in edge here, which I'm not a fan of, but is overall really not bad. One of the things that really helped the look is the keycaps. Now, there's two things that I like about them. First, the font is pretty normal. It's quite similar to Helvetica, which is excellent. Nice. Not one of those cyber fonts or stenciled letters for a change. Seems almost impossible to escape from those nowadays. The second one is more subtle, and it took me about a day to figure it out. It's the letter placement. Can you see it? See, most backlit keyboards have the lettering in the center top like this. It's because that's where the LED is located on MX-based switches. But here, it's in the top left corner, as it should be. So it's a good font, and it's in the right place. It's kind of saddening, isn't it, to think that this is now a feature, but I guess I'll take it nonetheless. The special characters are still centered for some reason, but this took me almost a week to spot, so apparently it's not that big of a thorn in my eye. It would still be better if they outlined those on the left as well, though. 
Another thing I like is the backlighting. Now, normally I don't think too much of it, but this one immediately stood out to me. It's possibly the most ostentatious light show I've seen yet. The lighting is quite bright, and it has unprecedented amounts of light bleed from under the keycaps, partly because it has a floating switch design, and this bathes the entire keyboard, not just the lettering, in unicorn farts. It's like having full-on mood lighting in your face. I think if you like RGB, this will really be your thing. Of course, you can just switch it off, but of all the keyboard RGB I've seen so far, and I've seen a lot, this one really stands out in how vivid and especially smooth it is. I realize it's a bit contradictory to say I like how simple the board looks, yet how garish the backlighting is, but honestly, hand on heart, I think as far as RGB goes, it's pretty cool. Note that with a floating switch design like this, you'll need to brush dust and bore chow out quite regularly because they light up like a brothel in high season, but still. Call it a guilty pleasure. I wouldn't hugely lament the loss of it, though. As with most other backlighting, the secondary legends don't light up fully, but the bundling is excellent, even difficult colours like white actually look white, and it doesn't flicker or separate like it does on some boards. Nice. It's also got a volume roller, a pretty nice one. I would have preferred it if it worked a little faster, you need to scroll relatively much to change the volume, but this is partly compensated by the fact that they made it stick out at the back as well, which allows you to scroll much further per turn than ones of which only the top is accessible, such as on a Corsair or this Logitech. It's also got a black and white OLED screen, 128 by 40 pixels in resolution, on which you can set pictures, animations, or draw stuff, or whatever. Again, it's something I'm a bit ashamed to admit I enjoy, but I do. <laughs> It has more in-depth functionality too though. It can show you your customization profiles, volume, though curiously not when you're using the volume roller, illumination settings, what music you're playing on Spotify, messages from Discord and CSGO stats, although I won't be testing the latter as I have a near limitless hatred for that game. <laughs> I have to say that the positioning of the screen is so far away and the size is small enough that I don't think this would be a practical medium to convey actual in-game information anyway. In fact, you probably won't be looking at any part of your keyboard while you're gaming, so the game aspect of it seems fairly useless, but the other applications are much more promising. The only problem is, it's got only this one button to navigate the menus, and the roller I guess, and it's explained terribly in the manual how to use it. They just say, hold button to access menu but then don't tell you how to select an item because if you just press the button on the item you want to select or double tap hold it or triple tap or whatever it just goes back you need to click the scroll wheel to select anything which I didn't even know you could do at first that would have been one simple but very useful line to include in the manual guys now, OLEDs are notorious for getting inverse burnt-in pixels. In other words, if you keep it on one single image for too long, the pixels that make up that image will become weaker. But that's why it's useful that it displays volume and other things occasionally too. And besides, when you haven't used the keyboard for a while, it uses this screensaver in the form of the SteelSeries logo. Again, nice attention to detail. The keyboard has macro capabilities as well. The six keys on the nav cluster can be programmed. I'll get to how that's done in a bit. And finally, a wrist rest. It's not spongy like some are, but I like that. For me personally, smooth ones like this are nicer. It's pretty comfortable, and it comes with magnetic latches. Interestingly, for a Hall Effect keyboard, these don't interfere with operation. Then it's time for some actual negative points. The keycaps are thin, laser ablated ABS, which looks nice, but these tend to be much less durable than double shot keycaps, and fingerprints are very clearly visible on them. The software is certainly not the best either. It's easy to use, but is required to have installed in order to program macros. It's rather buggy at the moment, and the macro programming especially is just hideous. It's got a fake macro option at the top, which allows you to record, but not assign macros. Instead, you need to do that by clicking a key and then selecting the macro as a function for it. You can also try to record a macro from this menu, but don't even try. 
Thankfully, you can program macros very easily keyboard side, but you still need the software installed or it won't work. Again, the procedure for this is described badly in the manual. You hold, yes, not press, but hold the function key plus the macro keys for three seconds. Then the color of the backlighting changes as well to let you know that you've entered macro mode, which is a useful detail, by the way. Then you input the string you want, let's say T-E-S-T, -E and then you finish with function plus F10 again and then press the key you want to assign it to. Interestingly, it lights up keys that you've already assigned macros to. It's easy enough when you know how it works and thankfully it allows you to circumnavigate that awful macro programming in the software, which might be the worst one I've seen so far by the way. Although by default it plays the macros in real time, so if you want them to play quickly like normal, you'll still need to change the macro settings for that key in the software. There were some bugs in the software as well. These two keys were out of sync with the rest of the backlighting on UK models specifically, and they couldn't be customized. And then when you saved the illumination settings, it promptly reverted them back to factory defaults. I've mentioned this to Steel Series, and they've since fixed it very quickly, actually. But the lighting that's shown in the software still doesn't always match up with what's being shown on the board. And I've still seen it randomly use factory settings for a short while. Also, it's now refusing to take this dancing banana off the OLED screen, even though I've tried changing the picture to something else, or clearing the picture entirely, or reverting all settings. I don't know, maybe it'll uh, reset itself when I reboot the computer. But the big elephant in the room is the price. It's $230, or $210 for the TKL, which they also do, making this their top-of-the-range product. Now, considering all the stuff that you get for it, I think a premium price is definitely justified. I mean, you're clearly getting a lot more for your money than you do on a $40 clone keyboard. But $230 is a lot of dough, and perhaps most disappointingly, it's not all Hall effect. See, the whole alphanumeric area is, but the F keys, nav cluster, and numpad aren't. They're basically Gatoron Reds made with custom molds and inspected by their own QC staff. By the way, Gatoron also manufactured the Hall Effect switches, but not the sensing assembly, which is held PCB side. The red switches are simple contact-based switches and aren't capable of analog output or actuation adjustment though. And I get it, it's probably not even very necessary to make it all whole effect, and I guess leaving them off allows them to price it more competitively, and frankly these Gatoron switches really aren't half bad either, but it's definitely a thing. Nowadays, Hall Effect switches aren't anywhere near as expensive as they used to be in the 70s, as prices of semiconductors required to make the Hall elements that the sensors are based on have decreased considerably. But the main cost issue, or so I've been told, is in calibration and the sheer computing power necessary to monitor the analog outputs of all these switches at the same time. And frankly, looking at the amount of stuff on the PCB, I can kind of see that. It's got two 32-bit ARM microcontrollers on it, for example. I mean, if I had to pick between this situation and paying $50 more to have the other keys whole effect based as well, I think this is a much better choice. And considering $230 is already a rather eye-watering price tag, I think they just didn't want to push their luck, which is fair. But it's still $230 for a keyboard that's not entirely contactless. So, is it worth it? Well, frankly, the key feels absolutely amazing, it has nice extra features, and the board works really well. There are some niggles, but as you might have been able to tell throughout the review, I was really struggling to come up with anything substantial to complain about, except perhaps how it wasn't 100% hole based and even that isn't that big of a deal in the end. How much you'd be willing to spend for all these features is a matter of budget and opinion, I can't really answer that for you. What I can answer for you is its most difficult and grueling test yet, something far more demanding than what I've shown so far. Namely, how does the smoothness compare to other contactless switches? Yes, you didn't think I'd let it get off that easily, did you? So I've got a bunch of truly terrifying opponents lined up, and they're all contactless. So I've got APT Hall Effect, Bloody Light Strike Opto Electric, Wooting's Adamax Flare Tech, Fujitsu Magnetic Reed, and even the original Microswitch Dual Magnet Hall Effect New Old Stock. So don't tell me I cut it any slack. These things are the absolute worst opposition any linear switch could possibly face. For reference, compared to contact-based switches, even really, really smooth ones, such as Fujitsu Leaf Springs, these are significantly superior. I'm talking an order of magnitude smoother. 
uh, if such a thing exists. <laughs> Compared to Cherry MX Red, it's not even a competition. I mean, it's like the Cherry Switch is filled with sand or something. Even if you were to lube the ever-living fuck out of it, it still wouldn't come anywhere close to this. So no matter if you're using lubed Gatron True Icky Holy Pandelios or whatever fancy MX Switch hack job is in fashion right now, this will beat the living poop out of it. Well, against the Ace Partech Hall Effect switches, it's pretty easy. The APTs don't stand a chance, the Omni points are much smoother. But to be honest, that's not a huge surprise to me, because even some of the better contact base switches can still beat these. I mean, they're still smooth, but not as smooth. Bloody's Light Strike switches are optoelectric switches with a similarly light weighting, and these are a much tougher opponent. Despite the fact that I haven't been given the chance to review these, they are in fact excellent, and I gave them the fifth spot on my list of best linear switches of all time. I have to say though, I was surprised to find that the Steel series was noticeably smoother than the Bloody's. The Bloody's are super smooth, don't get me wrong, but when compared right next to each other, the Steel series has a buttery side note, where that of the Bloody is more more powdery. It also sounds better actually, more bassy. I had the Wooting pegged as its toughest competitor, and indeed an overall feel it probably is. Compared side by side, they're honestly quite close, but on off-center key presses, the Wooting binds slightly more. And to be honest, I think that's a bit of a bottleneck, as pressing a key 100% vertically almost never happens anyway. So even here, the Steel Series wins, which I didn't expect to be honest, I thought it would be a tie. This ancient Fujitsu board is 40 years old now, but has also got some exceptionally light and smooth magnetic reed switches on it. In fact, these are even lighter than the Steel series. The weird noise they make is inherent to the sensing mechanism, by the way. It's what happens when the reeds open. I'd say on purely vertical key presses, they're actually slightly smoother than the Steel series, but like the Wooting, they bind a bit more on off-center key presses, this one more so than the Wooting actually. Of course, the Fujitsu is way older and second-hand, so it's maybe not a fully fair comparison, but I'd still say the Steel series is superior. And finally, the SW board, a Univac from 1973, is even older, but has new old stock, so its switches are in as good a condition as you're likely going to get. These switches are much stiffer, and even though they're good, very good actually, they can't compare to the Steel series. I think they just didn't have smoothness in mind as much when they were designing this as they do now. They do sound about 100 times meatier though, probably because they weigh about 100 times as much per switch. Overall, it's really nice. I genuinely enjoyed my time with this keyboard. I think if you like linear switches, you really ought to treat yourself to a contactless board like this at some point. And from a smoothness perspective, this one is off the scale. It can easily count itself among the very best of them. It's pricey, but in a case like this, I think it's justified. I'd call it an enthusiast's keyboard. More lobster than salmon, to coin a phrase. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, it was quite a long and in-depth one. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.